Hello and welcome to the Gaggle Bobo Challenge and if necessary destroy media narratives. I'm George Samuel and as you can see from my uh, background, I'm not at my customary place in uh, Budapest. I'm, I'm out on the road. Um, so um, you know, not the, all the, the books and everything is uh, not, not as pretty as it usually is, but uh, we have to make do with what we have. And uh, I just want to uh, make a few brief comments on um, the uh, extraordinary phenomenon um, of the relentlessness of our elites to keep the Ukraine war going. Um, we've been inundated with um, countless uh, media stories over the past uh, few weeks of uh, the poor uh, state of uh, Ukraine's armed forces, the uh, lack of success of uh, Ukraine's counteroffensive, um, the growing war weariness uh, among the European and American publics, um, and uh, you know the, the just the general uh, feeling that this uh, war is uh, going on uh, endlessly, and that the famous. Uh, prospects for uh, Ukraine's victory over uh, Russia are uh, receding uh, by the day. So in these circumstances, what would one expect uh, from our media? Um, well, stories suggesting that uh, NATO politicians are beginning to sound as if they want uh, talks to begin talks for peace, talks for some kind of armistice, uh, negotiations um, with Russia. But contrary, what's really going on is uh, the uh, sense that Europe's and America's elites are absolutely determined to keep a war going, even as uh, the it, it, its prospects for any kind of uh, success uh receding and even as more seriously uh the, the casualties that our purported ally ukraine is uh enduring uh begin to sound truly uh you know <laughs> either dem demographically catastrophic um so i just want to show you a few recent uh, stories and comments to indicate this uh insane insistence of uh, uh, West's elites to continue uh, with this uh, war. So first, let me show you um, our um, story. Um, and the first thing is uh, the story is suggesting our good friend Josep Borrell is not one to give up. It's always very good when, when uh, you know, you're not the one um, who's uh, doing the fighting, you know, your sons aren't the ones who are uh, likely to get killed, but that you're uh, ready to do or die as long as there's somebody else who's doing the doing and uh, the dying. So here we have a story in Politico, which says Borrell floats Ukraine peace talks next month. So you read that, I think, oh, that's, that sounds promising. Peace talks next month. Um, you know, we're we getting ready for bringing this war to an end in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, well, let, let's see. It says, uh, Borrell floats Ukraine peace talks. Josep Borrell, EU foreign policy chief, is eyeing a ministerial level meeting in late September to discuss peace in Ukraine. Oh, oh that, that sounds promising. Speaking at a press conference, in the Spanish town of Santander, uh, Borrell said officials were working on a high-level gathering that will probably take place in September. Oh, good. That's just, that's just a few days away. Um, according to an EU official, Borrell was referring to a plan to upgrade a meeting at the political director's level on the margin of the UN General Assembly uh, in New York, uh, to upgrade it to a ministerial level. Okay. Uh, the meeting would follow talks that took place with uh, more than 40 countries, including China, in early August in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which, according to Borrell, was, quote, 
another step by Ukraine to get the international community to put pressure on Russia to stop the war. Or else on a Monday, only Russia can stop it. Uh, Russia started it and Russia has to end it. So right away, notice what has happened within a few sentences. We have this uh, very promising uh, suggestion of peace talks uh, in September. And now Burrell tells us, well, what I have in mind is talks uh, that will exclude Russia. I see. So how exactly are you going to negotiate an end to a war uh, that excludes the participation of a key player in the war? And indeed, Borrell's comment, only Russia can stop it. Russia started it and Russia has to end it. It would suggest that Russia is the most important player. So how, if you accept Russia is the most important player, how can you then come forward and say, well, we're going to begin peace talks, but the peace talks will not involve Russia? I mean, make, this makes absolutely no sense. It's just insane. It's, it's just demented to suggest that, oh, we're going to have peace talks. Russia is the most important player. Russia started, Russia is the one who has to end it, but we will exclude Russia from these talks. Well, what kind of talks are they? I mean, they're, it's, they're not peace talks, of course, uh, but a public relations exercise. Anyway, it goes on. Um, looking back at the past year and a half, a combative and pensive Borrell blasted the West's hesitation in helping Kiev and did not shy away from criticizing the EU, uh, EU's and US's practice of sending weapons to Ukraine in dribs and drabs. So we started with peace talks, and now we have Borrell complaining that uh, the weapons are being sent in dribs and drabs, they're not being sent at a crisp enough pace for him. Again, this is an old man who himself is not going to be doing any fighting. Um, his children, I, I don't know whether he has children, but, you know, uh, but if he did, you know, he's going to make sure his children aren't going to be doing any uh, fighting. Um, so, he, but, he, but he wants, he knows that he wants that war to go on, um, even as He's, he's floating the idea of peace talks, floating. We've, that's how we started the story. And now we're already on to Borrell uh, complaining that, hey, where, where are the weapons, for God's sake? And then we have a question, a different path? When one decides to help a militarily invaded country, hesitating can be a very costly response, Borrell said at a seminar, Quo Vadis Europa, uh, in Santander. Um, hesitating can be a very costly uh, response. All right, then probably it's not such a great idea to go all in um, on behalf of a militarily invaded country if you've decided that this isn't really an existential matter for you, um, but that's what, what Europe has decided. I mean, so in a way, Borrell here is revealing his own idiocy, which is you've made this into an existential matter for Europe and the United States, which of course it, it isn't, wasn't, will never be. Um, and then you turn around and say, well, yeah, but when nobody's sending uh, weapons at a uh, pace that he, Borrell, would like. Well, yeah, that's because it's not existential. And the public knows that it's not existential. And even the politicians who pretend that it's existential know deep down that it isn't. Uh, but you know they, they have to keep going through the motions a la Borel of pretending that some huge stakes are, uh, are involved here. And we have to go on uh, sending whatever we've got. Then he goes on, quote, had decisions been taken faster and with more anticipation on some of the weapon systems that we, which we ended up sending, then probably the war would have taken a different path, and in any case, we would have saved lives. Now, Borrell here is saying something truly idiotic, and he had that he has no uh, basis whatsoever for saying. I mean, the notion that if you send more and deadlier weapons, you're going to save lives. Again, it's this is on the level of uh, you know demented talk. One much uh, given by NATO uh, spokesman, particularly our old friend, Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg, that somehow, well, the way to bring peace 
is to uh, send in more weapons. And you know, and somebody else, you know, a rational person might think, well, if you send in more weapons, then you're intensifying the conflict because Russia or anybody else isn't just going to sit still and uh, and wait to get clobbered. They're going to send in more and deadlier weapons of their own. That's kind of the way war has always been throughout history. Um, one, one side escalates, then the other side doesn't just back away. The other side escalates uh, further, which in turn uh, forces the first side to escalate uh, on, further on its own. That's the logic of war. It always has been. But apparently Josef Borrell and Jens Stoltenberg have reinvented war, reinvented logic. And so no, the war would have ended sooner and um, uh, and we would have saved lives. That's right. So we send in the deadliest weapons uh, in our armory and we would have saved lives. Um, and so it, it goes on here. Again, Borrell, dragging the war out on purpose. Borrell questioned why it is that the EU and the US have only gradually stepped up support for Ukraine and continue to hold back help first drawing the red line of tanks, then ruling out Patriot missiles and fighter jets, only to eventually send each of those weapons systems. Well, you could argue, yeah, that, that's that's right. It, it, it did make Europe look very stupid, deeply stupid. It made Biden look deeply stupid by first saying, well, we're not going to send <clears throat> these uh, weapon systems. Um, but all right, well, if you keep asking for it, but maybe we will. All right, well, we'll we'll think about it. And um, well, we've thought about it, then maybe we're gonna do it. Um, um yeah, we we've considered that maybe we'll do it. Yeah, we'll probably do it. Um, all right, we will do it. Um, but you know, we'll we'll probably do it next year. But all right, we'll do it, uh, but maybe we'll bring it the, the the data uh forward a little bit. Yeah, I mean it does make you look very, very uh, stupid, but it has nothing to do with um uh dragging out the war what's dragging out the war is your insistence on completely unrealistic goals and of course that then that Borrell and the rest of the gang aren't prepared to think and so instead they say oh no, no the war is dragging on not because we are uh, insisting on something that is unrealizable without our getting uh, directly involved in the fighting ourselves. In other words, NATO soldiers getting killed themselves. In other words, Borel's cozy, uh, wine-filled life um, coming to an end. Um, so, and then, the, you know, instead of that, uh, we'll just simply, you know, keep, keep the war uh, going and, and, and then blame uh, it on, not on, on our, our idiotic demands, but blame it on, uh, the weapons uh, not getting there fast enough. Borrell said it was a question of to which he himself did not have all the answers. Quote, we'll never know, and we can suspect all of what we want, um, he, he said, uh, but added that he hadn't heard anyone say they would deliberately, uh, that they would calibrate their help to Ukraine at the critical point where it is neither defeated nor can win. This is a, this bizarre, again, they live in the bizarre world. The issue somehow is, do we really want Ukraine to win? Oh, no, we want to just get it to a, a draw, as if that's where the discussion is, rather than that logic would demand the discussion should be, is which is, how do you bring this to an end? Um, and now, rather, well, do you, do you really want Ukraine to win, or do you want, do you want Ukraine to win uh, at a... a, a at a faster pace, or do you want to win at the slower pace, uh, or do you just want to keep dragging the war out? That that's at the level of which uh, Borrell is uh, thinking. And then we have Machiavellian weapon supply. Ooh, Machiavellian! I ask myself why the U.S. does not give Ukraine long-range capacity. So he's asking here. You know, notice he's kind of asking. Uh, it's a, a rhetorical question, a hectoring rhetorical question. The United Kingdom will do it. So everyone else, everyone has a different approach because the risk assessment or fear is different. But I don't believe, well, we can discuss this further later, but I don't believe it follows a deliberate tactic along the lines of, I will only give support in dribs and drabs so the war goes on and I can weaken Russia for free. No, no, no. So heaven forbid, I'm not accusing the United States of anything. 
But I am kind of accusing the United States of uh, insufficient eagerness to send weapons uh, fast enough. But but hey, don't uh, don't suggest I'm accusing America of anything. No no no, I, I wouldn't accuse any uh, American of anything. But Americans are playing some kind of a Machiavellian game. Though again, Borrell, even when he hints at this Machiavellian game, you still know what is what is the game that you're hinting at. What what is it? You know, the, um, you're suggesting that America that doesn't want Ukraine to win this war uh, fast enough, contrary uh, to the protests uh, of the United States. So he's hinting there's some dark motives, but, you know, he's too gutless, really, to spell them out. I don't believe it's a Machiavellian tactic. No, I don't believe it. It's not Machiavellian tactic. No, no definitely not. So, but, I, but I will suggest that there is a Machiavellian tactic involved. Um, why then? Instead, Borrell said he believed the reason for the hesitation and incremental support was more political and had to do with the interna internal equilibria. Uh, equilibria. Oh, he says, and uh, notice how he has these, you know, these bureaucrats always use these, um, uh, these vacuous, meaningless terms like equilibria. Um, equilibria. Uh, they, don't get, they don't actually know what an equilibrium is, um, but, it's, but it sounds uh, good. Uh, equilibria in the American political system and with the fear of provoking a type of reaction from Moscow. So again, this is, this is NATO speak, in which you're berating the Americans for lack of enthusiasm for getting into a war with Russia. Again, but if there's a war between the United States and Russia, Borrell's going to be okay. He'll still be going off to his uh, conferences. He'll be enjoying his uh, splendid meals and his fine wines. Um, but he's berating the Americans for uh, hesitations about getting into a, a, a war with Russia. And then it goes, Kharkovka Dam versus nukes. Borrell also said that Russia had stopped issuing nuclear threats since China had come out very strongly against such saber rattling. None of this is, of course, true. Russia has not changed its stance on uh, nuclear weapon. It said it right at the beginning. Um, that, you know, if you mess with us, we're ready to resort to nuclear weapons. Uh, well, or at least he's hinted at it, never said specifically, but said we, we are ready to use um, whatever, um, you know, our, our full range of uh, weaponry. Uh, you know, you can take that however you want. People took that as nuclear saber rattling, and, you know, maybe it was. Maybe, you know, I, I think uh, Putin wanted to make clear to NATO um, that we will not tolerate uh, any direct intervention um, in Ukraine. Uh, probably should have made it firmer, but nonetheless, he, he made that clear. And that therefore, if it were an existential matter, which according to Russia's nuclear doctrine uh, is the case, uh, if it were an existential matter for Russia, including incidentally conventional weapons, then Russia would be ready to use nuclear weapons. That's always been the case. Russia's nuclear doctrine uh, entails their resorting to nuclear weapons, even in the event of a conventional attack, if um, the the fate of the country depends upon it. Um, but there's not there's nothing new about that. Putin has been consistent in saying that. So this is a lie on the part of Borrell to suggest that well, China came out very strongly and Russia stopped saying it. No, Russia's continued to insist on the, that same point. Um, that hey, you know, uh, if if necessary, we will use all of our weapons um, in our armory. Uh, but the destruction of Kakovka Dam has had a tremendously destructive effect, which was probably the equivalent of a tactical nuclear weapon. But since it wasn't nuclear, it didn't cause the same rejection. The destruction is equivalent. The deaths are equivalent. All this is absolute bollocks. I mean, you know, to, to, not to put too fine a point on it. He's suggesting here that the, the Kharkovka Dam, which incidentally has not been established that it had anything to do with Russia. On the contrary, all the evidence suggests that Ukraine had been shelling this dam and then eventually after the shelling, uh, it collapsed. Borrell is suggesting the Russians were behind it. Borrell is also suggesting that the destruction uh, caused by this dam was the equivalent of tactical nuclear weapons. And now he's also suggesting, well, it's very unfortunate that we didn't resort to nuclear weapons ourselves in response to what the Russians did, 
just because it was it doesn't count as a tactical nuclear weapon use, even though he Borrell believes it's the same as a tactical nuclear weapon use. Really, I don't think he knows much about nuclear weapons and what nuclear weapons involve. If you suggest that the uh, breaking of a dam, however terrible that is, is the same as the use of nuclear weapons, but that's what he's talking. The destruction is equivalent. The deaths are equivalent. But hey. Apparently, the cowardly Americans, the sniveling cowardly Americans, don't have his particular bravery. They didn't resort to uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and then he says, amid all the chatter of F-16s and potential peace talks, Ukraine is ramping up its own homegrown arms industry with one eye on the potential return of Donald Trump to the White House. Private enterprise and volunteers are playing an increasing role in getting Ukraine uh, troops the weapons they need. Well, good luck with that. I mean, you know, that's going to be a, a, a long time for Ukraine gets its own um, uh, homegrown uh, arms industry. Um, but you know, nonetheless, that that's that's, that's all. the the nightmare and underlying all of these uh, articles is somehow hey, so, some terrible person is going to bring to an end this uh, limitless uh, su supply of arms to Ukraine. Um, now here's the Washington Post, an editorial by the Post, and um, we have war in Ukraine has raged for 18 months, prepare for more. So in other words, here's the Washington Post um, saying, hey, the last thing we want is for this war to come to an end. Prepare for more. He said, "Yeah, we got. We, we're going to keep this going." Again, very nice. It's in D.C. We're not getting killed. You know, we're, we're okay. We, we go home um, to our uh, suburbs in McLean, Virginia, and uh, Maryland, and you know, you know, nice and comfortable. No one's going to shoot at us. Um, no end to the carnage is in sight. And calls for a negotiated solution are wishful thinking at this point. This is the post. As Mr. Putin invests in Russia's war economy, he shows no signs of giving up his fantasy of Russian neo-imperial glory. No, I mean that's all the um, well, the Washington Post editorial writers' um, fantasy neo-imperial glory. There is, you know, there's nothing. There's no no involvement of neo-imperial glory. Russia has repeatedly said. What its aims are is it repeatedly warned NATO. I mean, how many times can they go on repeating uh, to NATO that we cannot accept expansion of NATO in uh, uh, against our borders? But no, rather than address that issue, rather than address the issue of uh, NATO's reckless expansion, let's invent concepts like Russia's neo-imperial glory. And you know, the, the boobs who read the uh, the Washington Post, you know, they probably say, yeah, yeah, Russia wants to restore its imperial glory. The hard truth leaves the United States and its European allies with few appealing options, especially as Ukraine's grinding military offensive launched in early June remains far short of its goal to evict Russia's forces. Okay, again, so the, the, it's, the failure, however... Don't for one minute think that anyone's going to stop. Deeply entrenched in the miles deep maze of defensive lines behind some of the most heavily mined terrain in, on Earth, the occupiers return control, retain control of roughly 18% of Ukrainian territory. So U.S. intelligence officials have concluded that Kiev is unlikely to achieve its main objective this year, uh, breaking south um, through enemy lines and reaching the Sea of Azov. The, the idea, but notice that it, it, it he, he, key, key word is an, uh, un, unlikely to achieve its main objective this year, which means, hey, it's always next year and the year after. And we're, we're going to be there ready to go on uh, feeding Ukraine uh, it, uh, the weapons it needs. Uh, and feeding its fantasies. The idea was to severe the occupied corridor that uh, through Ukraine that connects Russia to the Crimean Peninsula. Washington's intelligence assessments have been wrong in the past. Oh, that, that's a, so, you know, that the Washington Post thinks, okay, things aren't as bad as, as, as the intelligence uh, suggests. 
specifically by overestimating the proficiency of Russia's military and the competence of its political leadership, and by underestimating Ukraine's resolve and resourcefulness on the battlefield. Reports on the front line and from Russian military bloggers suggest that Ukraine morale remains high and that badly led, poorly supplied Russian troops are increasingly desperate. Um, well, in that case, why haven't the Ukrainians broken through? I mean, you just said uh, the Russian, uh, um, the, the uh, uh, Russians are badly led and poorly supplied. Morale is terrible, and yet apparently Ukraine's counteroffensive is completely flopped, and the and the, and they've been defeated by the Russians. I mean, again, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, Kiev's forces continue to make modest gains despite the daunting challenges of advancing against Russia's massively fortified positions. Again, you know, <laughs> not really making very much progress. The uh, Washington intelligence is saying they're not making much progress, but um, uh, you know, but Russia is really you know terrible morale, poorly led, you know, in lack of supplies. You remember those stories about Russia's running out of ammo, Russia's running out of missiles? That's from more than a year ago. Um, but again, that that's all kind of been forgotten. Even though, uh, how many stories did the Washington Post run along those lines and about the the bad morale? morale of Russian soldiers, the poor quality of the officers, and so on. I mean, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> the Washington Post has been running those stories pretty much every day since uh, um, the start of this uh, so-called special military operation. Um, the West, despite having sent massive amounts of military aid, has not supplied Kiev's forces in a timely way with the advanced fighter jet, long-range missiles, and tanks that Ukrainian officials have long pleaded for. So that's it. So again, this is Borrell, this is the Washington Post, this is uh, all of the neocons, uh, a lot of the uh, blowhards on Capitol Hill. Oh, if only we'd sent them everything early on, if only they got these uh, the long-range missiles, or if only they got these... Um, uh, fighter jets, they would have won the war. It's, it's a fantasy. And it, it just enables people to, to indulge themselves. Um, you know, remember, these are all warmongers. These are these the people who write these editorials. They're the same editorial writers who were urging a war in Iraq, the ones who were telling us that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, the ones that told us that uh, it would be a cake walk, the ones that told us that the Ukraine, the, the Iraqis would welcome the Americans uh, with uh, open arms. Uh, same crowd, same crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just, you know, if only we could send them more, um, Ukraine would have won. Why? How, how can they? I mean, Russia has far more in terms of weaponry than Ukraine has. Why would sending in whatever, you know, some long range missiles have achieved anything uh, other than uh, trigger? Uh, Russian attacks using its own long-range missiles, um, and and that's the, the even greater destruction would have been wrought on in Ukraine. Uh, only now are Ukrainian pilots learning to fly U.S.-made F-16 jets, which have figured prominently on Ukrainian President Zelensky's wish list since the first months of the war. Yes, it was on his wish list, but what would that have done? What would what would giving you fighter jets have done for you? Um, that it's never explained. None of these ever explained. Like what you know, you give them this weapon system. What what is it going to do for you? Delivery of the first of these jets is not expected until next year. Too late to supply air cover for Ukrainian ground troops uh, in their current push. But the air cover still would not have done any good for you because they've already said they're not making any headway against uh, these uh, mines. So what exactly would air cover have done for you? Um, and then the reluctance of leaders in Washington and Europe to furnish arms. This, you know, again, we now have the neocon uh, blame game, which is always the same. Always the, 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 so the logic is the same. If only we had done a lot more, a lot sooner, uh, we would have won. You know, the same thing with Iraq. Oh, well, if only we'd send in more forces. Oh, if only we'd... Um, uh, um, introduce the surge earlier, you know, everything would have been great and we, we would have won the war. It's always the same. The logic is always the same. Uh, you know, more war 
will bring us peace. That is that's the same thing with you know NATO's Borel, everyone. Oh yeah, yeah. Only we get more weaponry and uh the the the, the more likely is that we're gonna get peace. The reluctance of leaders in Washington and Europe to furnish arms on a timeline that might have improved Ukraine's territorial gains this summer has triggered frustration in Kiev and hand wringing among top Western diplomats. You know, Joseph Borrell. Uh, okay, why? You know, again, one always asks, "What? Well, what do we care about frustration in Kiev?" Faced with a long-term war of attrition, President Biden and other European leaders need a two-track strategy that encompasses short and long-term planning to ensure Ukraine's sovereignty and survival. Notice that when they talk about the two-track strategy, um, it's similar like the Quincy Institute, they also talk about two-track, but they usually say, yeah, yeah, keep keep uh, uh, arming Ukraine, but then we have the, uh, the the other track, which is robust diplomacy, which itself was, of course, ridiculous, because when if you keep arming Ukraine, that kind of vitiates diplomacy because that only leads to uh, cries that, hey, if only we send them more arms, we'll have even more success. Or if we send them more arms, then we won't have uh, the failures. Um, and therefore, the, the other track, the diplomacy track, gets quickly forgotten. But here, with the Washington Post, they don't even bother with the diplomacy track. So it says here, the short-term peace uh, means uh, maintaining support as all of Ukraine's major uh, allies have pledged to do with the current flow of U.S. assistance set to run out this fall. Mr. Biden has proposed a further $24 billion military and economic package. Oh, what a, how wonderful. That's, that's the $24 billion there, which always miraculously, the money for that is available for that for little else. Um, and then uh, it is critical that Congress approve that request, even as an increasing share of the American public, especially uh, Republicans, is souring on U.S. military aid. Yes, it's absolutely crucial. You know, it's heaven forbid, heaven forbid that the public should have a say in the matter. Um, increasing share of the American public. Wow, those are terrible. What horrible people. We, the last thing we want to do is to uh, pay any attention to what they think. Um, a bipartisan majority on Capitol Hill has embraced the idea that Mr. Putin's war of aggression is a threat not just to Ukraine's existence and its aspirations to join the family of free democratic nation, but also to the US-led uh, NATO. So this war of aggression is a threat to NATO. It's a threat to NATO's expansion, yes. But you know, who, who's under threat and why? All right. In the event that Mr. Putin succeeds in subjugating Ukraine, okay, you know what's coming. You know, terrible, horrific consequences for the United States. Uh, you know, this is the, we have to fight them over there, otherwise we'll be fighting them over here. There is no reason to believe that his next targets would include uh, NATO front uh, line member states that uh, uh, no, sorry, there is there is reason to believe these next targets would include NATO frontline members that the United States is obligated by treaty to defend not only with weapons but also with troops. Well, uh, first of all, there's no evidence for that. But even if there were evidence for that, um, you kind of got yourself into this mess by uh, expanding NATO. I mean, you know, what do you think is going to happen? when you start just throwing out these commitments, um, left, right, and center, you know, like candies to kids, you know, hey, there's a commitment for you, commitment for you, commitment for you. Um, and, you know, you, 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 you convinced that the bill will never come due. No one's ever gonna ask you to actually make good on these commitments. Uh, well, that's <laughs> that's the, 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 the method of, you know, the, the drunken uh, gambler. Um, that's that's the way the you know the, the basis of a pyramid scheme. You know, you just keep making all these uh, uh, promises. You don't really mean them, um, and you just hope that you'll never have to make good on them. Uh, now they say, oh well, you know, Putin's going to uh, uh, you know make threats against others. Yeah, well, you know, it, perhaps it wasn't such a great idea to bring Finland and Sweden into NATO, uh, given the threat. That uh, you know NATO's expansion 
into uh, Northern Europe would pose towards Russia, you know, the Barents Sea, the White Sea, uh, Murmansk, um, the Arctic, all of these were suddenly become under threat. It probably would have paid uh, to pay attention to Russia's uh, security concerns, but not, of course, with the Washington Post editorial writers. Um, in the long term, Washington and its allies in the group of seven leading industrial nations have agreed to formulate bilateral military support programs meant to arm Ukraine to the point that the Kremlin would be effectively discouraged from conducting future aggressive acts. Not really. I mean, again, the, the, the logic goes against it. Um, Russia was uh, triggered to act in response to all of the reckless promises that were given to uh, Ukraine. So the notion that this acted as any kind of a deterrence, it, it, on the contrary, um, it only um, served to convince the Russian leaders that they had to move fast before um, Russia's uh, geopolitical uh, vulnerability becomes a, a very serious uh, liability. And um, and that's really the way it goes with war. The notion that, oh, well, if you just simply uh, deter someone, you know, you arm somebody, that's going to be uh, the, the way to win uh, a, a conflict. Oh, you know, we'll peace through strength. You know, we, we arm an ally and that will deter somebody else from uh, trying anything. No. Again, history is replete with examples that when you start arming uh, a country, its neighbors start to look very anxious. And the more you arm, the more you promise that it's going to be a member of uh, your military alliance, the more you uh, make a commitment that, hey, um, you, you will we'll have your back in all circumstances. So you can, you'll basically have a free hand to pursue whatever diplomacy you want. The more you do that, the greater the anxiety you uh, trigger um, in other countries, that's always been the case. I mean, that's the way it's like we, we, it's like no one has learned anything from First World War, which is that when you have these alliances, then you know ev everyone is looking around very nervously as to what their um, adversaries are doing. So the idea that what would be effectively discouraged, no, in fact, Russia would be effectively encouraged to act militarily. Um, in the face of NATO expansion, in the face of NATO determination uh, to eliminate Russia as any kind of a uh, great power, as any kind of a, a, a geopolitical contender. So NATO membership with Ukraine, which would offer the ultimate security guarantee, is not in the cards as long as the war rages. Well, that's awfully good. Either. Still, Ukraine's allies should be weighing other post-war security arrangements. And then if and when the war ends, one template for Washington to consider is its commitment to South Korea, a nation that has prospered to the benefit of the United States and the global community of free nations through decades of hefty American security assistance. Hefty. Um, a similar approach might eventually promote stability in Eastern Europe. Notice again the stupidity of this comment. What did America's commitment to South Korea lead to? Hmm, let me think, let me think about that. Um, how about North Korea withdrawing from the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which it had been a signatory, and developing its own nuclear weapons? Hmm. Now, you know, for decades, we've been told that this is a huge crisis, this is a huge source of instability uh, for the world, that North Korea, whose regime the West uh, abhors, now has nuclear weapons. Quite sophisticated nuclear weapons, and North Korea has ballistic missiles. And I, I don't know, you know, how effective they are. I don't know whether North Korea can reach um, the United States with its um, ballistic missiles. Either way, North Korea has made itself a nuclear power, and a power that either now or in the very near future will be able to hit the United States with nuclear weapons. So this great success, this, this fantastic success in South Korea has led to this. Um, you know, something that the Washington Post, again, is usually uh, tearing its hair out. Oh my God, North Korea, what are we going to do about North Korea? What are we going to do? It's a, it's a great source of instability in the world today. 
So that's just something forgotten as they make this tiresome uh, party political point. And then, Mr. Ho Putin's only hope for victory lies in ending Western aid for Ukraine, a goal he hopes Donald Trump would advance if he's elected to a second presidential term. And there we have it. We have the, you know, the, 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 who, the, the two people we liberals hate most in the world, Putin and Trump. And there you are, Trump and Putin, um, you know, together again. That's it. They're going to bring, imagine that, they're going to bring the war in Ukraine to an end. Oh my God. Is there anything more villainous? Can you can anyone think of anything a more e diabolical um, eventuality than the war in Ukraine coming to an end by these these horrible evil creatures, Putin and Trump bringing it to an end? That's that's just too 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 awful to even think about. Well, that's the Washington Post editorial writers. History's clear lesson is that rewarding such a decorator's aggression will only invite more of the same. No, history has, it does not teach that lesson at all. History, what history does teach is um, the way you have peace is by acknowledging um, your friends, but above all your adversaries' interests, putting yourself in your adversary's uh, position, realizing what your adversary's security needs are, uh, appreciate that, you know, obviously, or to pursue your own interest, but if you can recognize that your adversary uh, is not a horrible, immoral uh, person, but you know a real uh, power, uh, a real state that has security concern, you know, then then you get peace. No one's asking you to like a particular regime or like this person or that person. Um, what they're asking for is that you bring peace and stability to the world. And that is, and that comes by recognizing your adversary's security concerns, and and act in a mature, responsible way. You know, it's not it's not going to be the end of the world for you. You know, the Cold War, particularly the you know, the Helsinki Final Act, was an example of how you could, and the various arms control agreements that were signed by successive U.S. administrations with the Soviet Union, are examples of how. You can live with an adversary and bring peace and stability to the world. But the Washington Post hates the idea of peace and stability because if you have peace and stability, you don't, you're not advancing America's uh, imperial you know, hegemonic ideas. You need, for that, you need instability, uh, you need wars, and that's the way uh, America advances itself. That, that's the Washington Post way of doing things. Part of laying the groundwork for a sustained commitment to Ukraine will be for Western leaders to explain to their voters why it's necessary. Well, that's a challenge because I have no idea what the hell they're going to say, and they're not doing a very good job with what they're saying now. So, um, anyway, so now um, here we have you know, more uh, along those lines. This comes from Responsible Statecraft, and the headline is pretty good. It says, are U.S. officials signaling a new forever war in Ukraine? Now that Kiev's counteroffensive is foundering, goalposts and the timing for talks and the ceasefire are quietly being moved. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's exactly right. I, I, just, I wouldn't agree about the goalposts being quietly moved. I think the goalposts remain the same. But yeah, it's a, a forever war. They're making clear that they're, they're ready for a forever war, as long as somebody else is doing the dying. And then here we have um, the headline from the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, and it says here that um, Ukraine slog, this is the, the headline, Ukraine slog prompts focus on next year's fight. Notice next year. So already 23, that, that's gone. Now, now it's 2024. So with big gains elusive this year, planners consider how training and new equipment might tip the battlefield balance in the spring. Okay, so that's it. So uh, we're talking about the spring and then Ukraine's current campaign to retake territory occupied by Russian forces could still have many months to run, but military strategists and policymakers across the West are already starting to think about next year's spring offensive. So we're now already talking about the next year's spring offensive. This is a dumb deal. You know, we're not worrying about that. We kind of failed. 
But next time, uh, no one, no one is 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 going to uh, step away. No one is going is interested in uh, continuing uh, or interested in initiating any uh, negotiations, any peace conference. No, no, no. Just going to keep sending arms to Ukraine. This this is uh, the 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 gift that goes on giving. Uh, just a, a forever war in Ukraine. Um, and 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 that's uh, that that's now the, the thinking of the West elite. Uh, the shift reflects a deepening appreciation that, barring a major uh, breakthrough, Ukraine's fight to eject Russia's invasion forces is likely to take a long time. So everyone can breathe a sigh of relief. Policymakers uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, legislators, uh, think tank denizens, newspaper columnists, newspaper editorial writers. Um, you know the, the the military, the arms industry, the the lobbyists. Everyone can breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah, don't worry. Yes, the Ukraine um, counteroffensive has failed. On to the next counteroffensive. Uh, you know, keep 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 up the uh the keep the aspidistra flying. Um, so I just wanted to show you that um. Some of the commentary that that we've seen, um, particularly in the alt media, has suggested that uh, the West is seeking ways out after the failure of the counteroffensive. The West is seeking some way out of the uh, the, the um, impasse that it's got to on Ukraine, and is making some quiet, tacit overtures to the Kremlin to bring this to an end. I've I've seen no evidence. Uh, at all, that the West is abandoning the, uh, Ukraine, that the West is pulling the plug on Zelensky, that the West is, uh, you know, want, wants nothing more to do with it. There's just simply no evidence for it. It's just wishful thinking. And, and I just wanted to show with a few examples, and these examples can be multiplied by a hundredfold, that the attitude of the Western media, the attitude of Western politicians, Western policymakers remains the same. We've got to keep this war going. It's an absolute freebie for us. We don't really lose anything. Um, you know, we, we we don't get killed. Our sons don't get killed. Yes, economically, our countries are, are being dragged down, but we really don't care about that. We, we, I mean, they <laughs> we've already said openly that we actually don't care that our cover countries are becoming impoverished, that our countries are use are uh, not able to use energy cheaply. Anyway, that's a great thing. We you know, we're against fossil fuels. Um that we, you know, that uh, uh, that we're just simply uh, funding uh, a war a long way away, and that we're not unable to address domestic programs. We don't care about any of that. Um, what matters to us is maintaining uh, this war, uh, fighting Putin for whatever reason we decide it's so important to fight for Putin, and. They're not, they're not going to give up. And so unfortunately, there's too many um, wishful thinkers uh, who continually uh, pass these articles and see some uh, hints here and there or some you know oblique expression that there might be some kind of negotiations taking place in the background to bring this war to an end. Show me the evidence. That, that's my feeling. Anyway, um, uh, thank you very much for joining me. Um, sorry about the uh, the unusual setting. Um, as I say, um, I'm on the road. Uh, we will be back tomorrow at the usual time and at the usual place. Um, look, looking forward to speaking to you then. Uh, thank you for today. And remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.